Sequels aren't easy to make. A lot of the time, it's hard to follow up something so great with something just as good. At the same time though, it can also be just as good, if not better, as the first installment. Since now the devs have had time to look at the flaws, things that didn't work, and things that people didn't like from the first, while at the same time, coming up with new ideas to incorporate in the sequel. When it comes to video games, a lot of the time the latter is the case, and one of the best examples of this is the second generation of Pokemon. When Pokemon Red and Blue were made, Game Freak didn't quite have the same time or resources to make the game as perfect as they wanted, but with the massive, massive, unparalleled, godly success of the game, its sequel would get everything it needed to be a masterpiece. And Gold and Silver sure are, with it being many people's favorite Pokemon game, especially its remake on the DS, Heart Gold and Soul Silver. But do the originals on the Game Boy Color still hold up? Well today, let's find out and take a look at the third installment of Gen 2, Pokemon Crystal. To get things off to a great start, Crystal is my favorite opening cutscene of a Pokemon game ever. At first, it's kind of creep with these unknown, and an unknown beast moving across the field. But then he moves across the screen in a pretty good looking animation for the Game Boy Color. The music starts to pump you up. The unknown spell out Crystal, and then the title screen. In tradition with the rest of the franchise, you get a cutscene with the regional professor. Well, actually this time, no. Because while there is a regional professor of this game, named Elm, the one that guides you to start is Oak. I guess even the game designers realized no one would like Elm. But anyway, one big thing this generation introduced, although only in Crystal, is the ability to play as a girl. Now, I was tempted to choose to play as her for this playthrough, but if I did, no one would ever let me hear the end of it, so I'm not going to. Oh, you know how in the first game Oak forgets his own grandson's name? Well, here he oversleeps. Yeah, I think I think Oak, Oak needs some medication from a doctor. It, it's too bad those, those those don't exist in the Pokemon world. They're all Pokemon nurses for only Pokemon. I mean, there was like the doctor guy from the anime, but if, I, I wouldn't yeah, I wouldn't let him do anything to me, or else you're probably gonna die. Stepping out of their house, the player finds themselves in New Bark Town, the first city in a new region west of Kano, Johto. And I love this town to death, everyone just seems so friendly and wholesome. And the music is one of the most nostalgia inducing tunes of all time. It makes you feel like a young kid again and brings you back to better times when you don't have a care in the world and there's still so much wonder in it. The main character of the game is Gold, who despite being a stir of everyone's favorite Pokemon game is always forgotten. I think his design is pretty cool, especially his back sprite at the start of a battle. It looks so good for being 8-bit. And while I know his name is actually Ethan, I'm just, I'm just gonna call him Gold because it sounds a lot cooler. And he's also very popular with all the ladies. Just look, look at how many girls think he's cute. And it's, man, I, what, what I wouldn't give to be him. His female counterpart varies on a version. In Gold and Silver, she doesn't exist at all. In Crystal, her name is Chris, and in Heart Gold and Soul Silver, a new female protagonist named Lyra took her place. Your rival in this game is awesome, though. While I don't mind later rivals being super nice, I think I still prefer them being somewhat of a jerk. Silver, though, is the most villainous rival of the whole series. A disturbing game, you can see him outside of Professor Elm's lab. You talk to him, he kicks you away. This is one of the only times in a series where a trainer is actually violent to another. Later, he breaks into Elm's lab and steals a starter Pokemon. I don't know how he actually managed to do that, but at least that Pokemon won't, won't be left on the table forever, so... I mean, there's that, and so, so good for him. Throughout the journey, you fight him, and he builds up his team, which isn't bad, I must say. Out of every rival, though, I think he probably has the most hatred of the main character. But even so, he goes through a bit of character development, slowly building his trust of his Pokemon. By the end of the game, his relationship with Gold is not of hatred anymore, at least not as much as it was at the start, but out of actually battling, having some amount of respect for him. One cutscene only found in Heart Gold and Soul Silver actually shows him going back to Elm's lab to return his stolen Pokemon, only for Elm to let him keep it, which is pretty heartwarming. His backstory is pretty sad, honestly. He's actually the son of Giovanni, the former leader of Team Rocket. Now having that as your dad uh, doesn't exactly set you up to have a great moral compass, but it gets even worse. Three years previously, when Red defeats Giovanni at the Viridian City Gym, he disbands Team Rocket and straight up abandons him. As for his mother, it's never directly stated who she is. She could honestly be anyone, because Giovanni could get pretty much all the women he could ever want with his money and stuff. 
Um, but, I mean, she would need to have red hair since he doesn't have red hair. But a strong fan theory is one of the executives in Team Rocket you see later in the game is his mother, which would make sense of her red hair and all. It's not surprising that Silver turned out the way he did, which is really sad, but it's good to see him change for the better, at least to the point he did. Like with every generation, the starters are one of the most important aspects of the game, and this games are okay. They're not as great as in other generations, though. The starter I usually go with is Cyndaquil, the fire type. There's not really anything that's unique about it other than it evolving into its second form a bit earlier than the rest, that being Quilava, and then into its final form, Typhlosion. He's the best choice, though, since he can learn moves like Thunder Punch or Earthquake to cover its weaknesses. Next is Totodile, which is what I went with for this playthrough. It evolves into Croconaw, and then into Fear Alligator. It's not bad, but there are tons of other good water types in Johto, a lot more than fire types, so Cyndaquil is the best way to go. I only chose Totodile just for variety's sake, because I've played his uh, Diplosions so many times. And after that, the weakest of the three is Chikorita and its later forms of Bayleaf and Meganium. I've never chosen Chikorita as my starter, but its stats just aren't great. It doesn't learn that good of moves, and to make things even worse, it's weak to a lot of gyms, especially early on. And even though no one's asking for this, I'm gonna mention the rest of my team anyway, because why not? Firstly, I caught a uh, Pokemon on my team, but I've wanted to try out for a long time, Gengar. Gengar is the evolved form of Haunter, but it only evolves when traded, and that's something I've been able to do for years, because I haven't had multiple copies of this game. But this time, I just traded over uh, Haunter from like my old 3DS virtual console version of Gold, I, we, the first version of the game I played. Um, and then, yeah, I got it. I got a Gengar. Gengar is awesome, though. I taught it Shadow Ball to destroy Psychic types and Curse to bring out Pokemon that don't go down easily. Another Pokemon I had to trade over was Houndoom, a Fire Dark type that's super strong, but you can't get it until the post game, hence why I had to transfer it over to use it early on. I also tried Zatu for the first time, although this game probably wasn't the best time to uh, try it out because it really doesn't learn that good of moves in this game. And it's really not that awesome of a Pokemon, so I probably should have gotten with something else. The Victory Bell wasn't a Pokemon I was actually planning on keeping the whole game, um, it was just that one Pokemon we have at the beginning. Um, when there aren't a whole lot of other Pokemon available, and it just kind of grew on me. But it took forever to finally get a Leaf Stone from that one girl. And lastly, like every single time I've ever played for Gen 2, I chose an Espeon. It's a great Pokemon with its psychic attacks obliterating everything, but it takes a long time and a lot of work to evolve. In Goldenrod, you get an Eevee from Bill, and you can evolve it into a multitude of different forms, one of them being Espeon, but to evolve it into Espeon, you have to raise its friendship to the max, well, almost the max, in the daytime. And to do that, you have to give it haircuts, walk around a lot, level it up, and fight without letting it faint, especially against gym leaders and uh, stuff like that. And let me tell you, it takes forever for it to evolve, like, I, especially in Gen 2, like, wow. For this playthrough, uh, it didn't even evolve, my, my Eevee didn't evolve into Espeon until Victory Road. And in the tradition with the rest of the Pokemon retrospectives of naming my psychic types after Earthbound characters, I named it Ness. I really hope I don't make too many more of these, or um, I'm gonna be running out of names here soon after like... So like, I have I, uh, only four more videos I can make before I ran, run out of names for my psychic types. Alright, now on to new things this generation added, which is more than any other Pokemon game in the series by a huge margin. Firstly, the graphics are much better than they were in red and blue, everything's in color, and I love the way sprites and battle look, with a lot of detail, color, and fluent animation. A lot of gameplay aspects were refined too, you now have a number of different pockets in your pack for different items, one for HMs and TMs, one for key items, one for Pokeballs, and one for everything else. Furries are also a new addition, there are many different types that have different effects. Some of them restore health, or others cure status conditions. The only issue they have in this game is how they don't have their own pocket in the bag, so you can't hold on to as many as you'd like. In addition to berries, there's also apricorns. You find them on various trees throughout Johto, and there are a number of different types, just like berries. You can take them to Kern and Azalea Town, and you'll turn it into a special kind of Pokeball the next day. Some of these balls are better for catching water Pokemon, others for ones that move fast, and others for low-level Pokemon. 
But that's not all the gameplay changes though. Dark and Steel types were added. Ghost types are now actually effective against Psychic types. You can assign a key item to select. Pokemon now have genders. You can breed Pokemon and get an egg out of it that hatches eventually. There's new moves, new Pokemon, old items, and for the first time in the series, Shinies. One aspect I don't like about the gameplay is the whole phone system. I mean, it's a cool idea, but like, it's so annoying to get random phone calls all the time. The thing that probably left the biggest impact on the franchise though after breeding is the time cycle, which I've already talked about in every Pokemon retrospective video I've made so far, so I'll keep it brief. In the game, things change in real time, with different Pokemon appearing at different times of day. There's also a number of different events that take place not only at different times of day, but different days of the week as well. Now, while I like the hourly cycle, I think the weekly cycle is a bit much. I hate having to wait until certain days to do stuff like pave a move tutor to teach certain moves and stuff. Thankfully, the weekly cycle was cut in later games, which is for the better to be honest. I still love the day and night cycle though, it immerses you in the game more, and I like the way things look at night. However, there is one major problem that this causes to the original Game Boy Color cartridges, because it takes a lot of juice to preserve the clock data, and drains a save battery a lot faster than most other Game Boy games, it will die within 5-10 to 10 years most of the time. So whenever you buy an original copy of this game, be sure it comes with either a new battery or solder a new one in before starting a new playthrough. For this video, I'm playing the freest virtual console version so we wouldn't have to worry about that, and uh, since it only costs like 10 bucks instead of 100, but I, but I do have to mention just how dark and dull this version of the game looks. I, mean, I even had to color correct it and sharpen it, well actually, I didn't sharpen it, I made it the first two recordings look like crap and then so if you're wondering why some stuff in the video looks a bit different than others that's why but I had to color correct it in OBS and that still wasn't enough I had to go color correcting more when I was editing this video so yeah and there's this annoying freaking car in the background I don't know if you guys can hear that but yeah I, I really wish I would have just gone out and spent a hundred bucks whatever or had um, the courage to delete my old save file on my um actual legit copy of this game and just play it on a Game Boy Player because honestly I think that looks a lot better. So, I regret. Regret. But um, let's move on. The thing I like the most about this game is the atmosphere. I love the way the sprites look, the various locations throughout the game, and most of all the music, especially the random encounter theme. This theme right here is, in my personal opinion, the best random encounter theme not only in the Pokemon series, but in any RPG I've ever played. It pumps your adrenaline up, and the first few seconds are total ear candy. It just has this nostalgic late 90s, early 2000s vibe, mixed with that classic 8-bit feel. It's probably one of the most ambitious and well-made 8-bit games of all time. You think about it, Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal are the last 8 bit games to have been a massive sensation. Now back to locations, Johto has a lot of great ones, and one of my favorites in the adventure is the Dance Theater. I like the traditional Asian aesthetic, which is something that's surprisingly not very common in the Pokemon world despite the first four games taking place in Japan. You also get to fight the five Kimono sisters, each of them using a different evolution of Eevee. Another cool place is Bellsprout Tower with monks, and its shaking pillar is enchanting, but it doesn't exactly seem very safe or stable. Another tower lies in Ecrutic City, known as Burnt Tower. In the basement lie three legendary Pokemon, Suicune, Raikou, and Entei, but they all run away, so I'll cover them later. But my favorite place of all is the Ruins of Alf, a mysterious ancient labyrinth with some slightly unsettling music and much to discover. In one room in the ruins is a tile puzzle, and solving it creates a hole in the floor, which leads back to the main room. Only now, a new Pokemon can be encountered. Unknown. It's probably the worst Pokemon in the whole series. It just sucks so bad, and its only gimmick is there being a number of different physical appearances of it, and each of those appearances look like a corresponding letter in the alphabet, hence why this place is called the Ruins of Alf. Some more rooms have tile puzzles of their own, which unlock even more forms of unknown, and there are also some secret messages that tell the story of the tomb. It's not anything special, but it does add mystery to the place. The thing that makes this place kind of creepy though is what happens if you take out and try to listen to the poker radio here. Most channels are the same, but in 13.5 you get this.
Both Bellsprout Tower and the ruins of ALF would go on to be big elements in one of the most famous creepypastas of all time, Pokemon Lost Silver, which is something that I was weirdly obsessed with when I was 12, and to this day, that depiction of gold with no limbs, pale white skin, and bloody eyes still fascinates me for some reason. Maybe if you guys want, I'll talk about it in another video someday, I don't know. Moving on, I think it's time we discuss Johto's gym leaders, and they're pretty hit and miss to be honest, especially when it comes to typing. The first one you fight is Faulkner, he uses flying type, so you better think of something you chose Chikorita, although his Pokemon are super low level, even for this point in the game. And one thing I really don't get is why the team he gives you after winning is Mudslap, which is a ground type move and not a flying type one. Second up is Bugsy, who, as his name implies, uses bug types, and because of that he's also super super easy, especially considering most of his team isn't even fully evolved. The gym leader that comes next, though, is quite different, and is someone that everyone loathes. Whitney. She only uses two normal type Pokemon, the first being a Clefairy, that goes down really really fast. What comes next, though, is her Mill Tank, which is as fear-inducing as Cynthia's Garchomp. Its stomp does quite a bit of damage. It can use a track to immobilize your Pokemon, if it's the opposite gender at least. It can use Milk Drink to restore health, but thankfully none of those two latter options happen to be during this fight. Worst of all though, by far, is Rollout. It doesn't do that much damage to start off, but each turn of damage it does doubles for the next 5 turns before resetting. This means by the 4th or 5th turn, maybe even by the 3rd turn of her Milk Tank using Rollout, it'll pretty much insta-kill anything you throw at it, unless it's really really high level, they're like a Steel type or a rock type or something. So to beat her, you have three options. Either you get your team ridiculously strong and knock your melt tank out fast, or you can be cheap and spam either Mud Slap to lower its accuracy, or use Curse to guarantee its death in a few turns. I used a third method in this playthrough, and it worked out okay. The only problem with it is that Curse doesn't do any damage if the opposing Pokemon faints, so it was kind of a close call there towards the end. I'd say the Mud Slap method probably works the best though, honestly, and I'd still say grind a lot for this fight. I will admit two things though, first, I've actually never struggled with this fight much, maybe it's just because I tend to overlevel early on when playing these games, or maybe it's just because I've been using the mud slap method a lot, or maybe it's just because of dumb luck, I don't know. And second, I had a huge crush on her as a kid, she just seemed so cute and friendly, it's all not to like her. Well, I mean, if it wasn't for her crying after you win, and calling you a child despite her being the one bottling her eyes out, and according to the internet, she's like 20, so basically the same age as I am right now, and acting Im more immature than like any other character in Pokemon that's ever existed. You know what, though? I think I'd still go for her. I better cut that out of the video. The next gym leader is Morty. There's not much to say about him other than he uses ghost types. In a team, he hands out a Shadow Ball, the first awesome ghost type move in the franchise. After that, we have Chuck. Imagine Crasher Wake only, not having as severe of mental problems, a wife, and actually being a fighting type leader instead of water type 1. Gym leader 6 and waifu number 2 is Jasmine. You can't challenge her the first time you meet her, instead having to go fetch some medicine for a sick Pokemon from across the sea. I wish it was that easy to cure pets in real life. When you finally do get a challenger, she's one of the easiest in the series, all things considered. Her team is like really high level too, but they're steel types, so there's a few fire type moves will take out all of them pretty easily. Fire types also destroy Price, the ice type user, 7th gym leader, and creepy old man. And the last gym leader of all, and waifu number 3, is Claire of Blackborn City. Her team is pretty good, consisting of high level dragon types with good moves. I also love the way her gym looks too while we're at it. And, um, yeah, but what ruins her is how she's a total bitch when she loses. Refusing to hand out the gym badge unless you get a dragon spang from the dragon's den. She does get scolded by the elders at least, so there's that. One area of weakness this game does have that I do have to address is the story and regional team. There isn't really any main plotline other than to become the champion and to stop Team Rocket. That's right, they come back for this game. You encounter them for the first time at Azalea Town over kidnapping Slowpoke and selling their tails. After stopping them, Silver comes along and states just how much he hates Team Rocket, showing how much pain they've caused him. Later on in Mahogany Town, you encounter them again, only this time they're broadcasting strange signals in a lake of rage to force magic carps to evolve into Gyarados. On the plus side, you get to catch a shiny Gyarados here, which, let's be honest, is the only shiny many of us have ever caught. 
you and Lance clean Team Rocket out of their base, and Silver shows up and fights Lance. And this is where he starts to change for the better. The final showdown with Team Rocket is almost immediately after this, when they take over the Radio Tower and Goldenrod. Here you give them the final blow, and a new ringleader of Team Rocket, who doesn't even have a name by the way for some reason, disbands Team Rocket, just like Giovanni before him. And that's the end. Well, I mean, at least of Team Rocket. After this, though, um, the director of the tower gives Gold a clear bell. If you return to Ecrity and go into the second tower there, known as Tin Tower, the monks now let you in. The legendary beasts are encountered once again, only this time Suicun can be battle and caught. I screwed up, though, and forgot to save before entering. Ran out of Pokeballs and had to do like an hour of things all over again, so... Yeah, that's a, that's a recurring theme throughout like all my videos, is, is me forgetting to save and then have to redo a lot because I screw up, so I, I really need to stop doing that. Well, with that, there's only one thing left to do. Beat the Elite Four. Johto's the only region so far that doesn't have its own league. Instead, you enter Kano and take on the Indigo League. The one thing that's a bit annoying, at least at first, is after entering Kanto, you can't fly back to places in Johto. Thankfully though, it's not that long of a trip to get back at least. What I like most about the victory road of this game though is instead of being a giant long cave full of ace trainers, it's a short one, without much except for a rival battle of silver. All of those super strong ace trainers are on a route outside, and there's a place to get healed as well. It's the least frustrating and easiest victory road of all time. I don't know why later victory roads are like they are in the first game despite this being a lot better. Anyway, even though the Pokemon League is in the same location as Gen 1, almost all of the Elite Four have been replaced. The first member is Will, a psychic type user and the one who gets blitzed the easiest, at least in my case because like half my team knew bite. Why the cut lore alive for him is something I'll never understand. The second member is actually Koga, the old Poison-type gym leader of Fuchsia City in red and blue, but he got promoted to the Indigo League somehow. After beating him, you fight the only Elite Four member who was actually in the Elite Four originally, Bruno. He's a Fighting-type user, so if you have a Psychic-type, this is pretty easy. The fourth and final member, and waifu number four, is Karen. With a name like that, you'd expect her to be, well, I mean, a Karen, but she's pretty chill. She's the only dark type specialized trainer in the whole game, and for some reason it took until like Gen 8 for there to be a dark type gym leader. She's the toughest to beat since dark is only weak to bug and fighting, neither of which I usually have on my team. The league champion is Lance. Yeah, I forgot to mention earlier that he actually got promoted to champion. Well, oops. Um, this battle can be really, really annoying. Lance is cheap. He spams Hyper Beam, Outrage, and Full Restores, which I didn't have to deal with, thankfully, because I imagine knock his Pokemon out before her health got too low. You might ask how I did this. Well, if you have a Fear Alligator and teach it Ice Punch, this fight is a cakewalk. Well, almost. I say almost because one of the Dragon Knights he has has Thunder. Yes, he has multiple of them to be exact, and Dragonite isn't even supposed to evolve until level 55 anyway. Despite how cheap Lance is, he's the easiest champion to beat of like all time, even without spamming Ice Punch. In the end, this battle is pretty decent, but also kind of mad at the same time. I mean, I like Lance, but he's not really champion material. He'd four material, yeah, but eh. Don't worry though, because there'll be something else later on that's much, much better and makes up for it though, so stay tuned. Once Lance is beat, and there's the whole victory cutscene where a professor comes in, which is Professor Oak and not Elm, because I think everyone, no one likes Elm. Um, your teams are added to the Hall of Fame, and a credits play, you know the drill. But if you thought this adventure is anywhere near over, oh boy, are you wrong. What I think is the number one reason why this is so many people's favorite Pokemon game is the fact that you get to explore almost the entirety of Kanto in the post-game. It's not exactly the same as Kanto was in Gen 1, however with a lot being different as it's set three years in the future. Lavender Town has been completely transformed, with Pokemon Tower no longer being a gravesite, and instead being a radio tower of all things. So they basically had to dig up a bunch of corpses and move them to this house. I mean, that kind of sounds like grounds for a, a, a poltergeist-like creepypasta of Pokemon. One of those probably already exists, and it probably sucks. I don't know. The power plant is no longer abandoned, and it's now operational. Well, it was at least. The last Team Rocket member stole a machine part, and you have to go get it back. After returning it, you can now ride the Magnet Train back and forth between Kano and Johto. A lot of areas like the Savari Zone, Cinnabar Island, and certain tunnels are closed off, so it's not, you can't explore pretty much any, anything in Kanto in Gen 1. But uh, let's be honest, it's, Kano as it is here is still a way better post-game than any other generation. 
You can challenge with Kanto Gym Leaders too, although their Pokemon are obviously way stronger than they are in Gen 1, or else this would be, like, ridiculously easy and there wouldn't really be much of a point of it. Since Koga got promoted to Elite Four, his daughter Janine took his place, and Blue takes Giovanni's place. All of them except for Blue are super, super easy, but actually even Blue is, like, super easy. I only lost, like... Actually, I don't even think I lost any Pokemon, I don't know. I, it's been like a couple days since it, and I'm tired, but he, all of them are pretty easy. And um, most of that is just because the order you're supposed to do them in is a bit different in Gen 1. Um, and I like explored every single route before taking any of them on, so I was pretty overleveled. Okay, let's get to something I haven't been looking forward to at all. The Legendaries, specifically two, Raikou and Entei. Both of them are roaming Legendaries, a mechanic I despise with every fiber in my being. After running them out of the Burnt Tower, Raikou and Entei can now be encountered on a random route in Johto. The key word is random though, and there are so many routes that you could go the whole game without running into them. I thankfully managed to run into Entei while playing the game normally, but it took like an hour, an hour, of searching for Raikou to finally find him. Anyway, once you finally do encounter them, they run away after only one turn. On a plus side though, they do keep any damage you do to them, although not status conditions. They don't even bother using moves like Mean Look to keep them from running away, because they know Roar to scare your Pokemon off the battlefield. After fleeing, they run off to another random route, and thankfully you can see where they are off the Pokedex. One problem though, Whenever a player enters a new route or goes somewhere else, they move somewhere else. So the only way to find them is to fly off to random places and hope you just so happen to enter a route where they randomly appear there. Well, kind of. It's not totally random, and there is a guy to sort of help you out, but these tips don't work all the time. At least in Crystal, there's only two roamers, because in Gold and Silver, Suicune was one too, instead of being encountered at the Tin Tower. I also used my Master Ball in Raikou, so Entei was the only one I had to track down and catch, which still took a few hours to do. I love the rest of the game to death, I, d I really do, but catching the Legendary Beast is something I really don't enjoy doing. After you catch the beast, if you re-enter the Tin Tower, it's possible to snag yet another Legendary, Ho-Oh, who I honestly thought was named Ho-Ho for years. Apparently I can read as a kid. At the same time, Lugia can also be caught, but both of them are annoying to catch. They're high level, have strong moves, low capture rates, and most of all, they spam recover over and over again. Uh, my tip is to use moves like Ice Beam and just hopefully freeze them because it helps a lot or maybe putting them to sleep. Paralysis doesn't do anything in this generation. Don't even bother. After that, there's only one more Legendary, although this one can't be obtained in most cases, at least unless you cheat or have glitches or something. Celebi. Celebi was a special event Pokemon back in the day, and unfortunately, you can't catch it during normal gameplay, unless you have the 3DS Virtual Console version of Crystal. If you are playing this version, after beating the Elite Four, go to the Goldenrod City Pokemon Center, and a worker there hands out a GS ball. Take this GS ball to Kurt in Azalea Town, and he'll take a look at it. The next day, he'll give it back, and he talks about how strange the forest is. If the player takes this ball to the shrine in the middle of the forest, Celebi appears and can be captured. It's too bad this had to be triggered by a special event only in Japan, which are words muttered way, way too often while discussing legendary Pokemon. With two regions explored, 16 gym badges collected, 5 legendary cots, 1 special event legendary cot, and Elite 4 beaten, we've pretty much gone over everything to do in the game. But there's still one more thing to do. Professor Oak gives the player permission to explore a place called Mount Silver after collecting all 16 gym badges. Here you can find all sorts of strong and rare Pokemon. It's a decent place to grind overall. There's some good items, and it's a nice touch in an already amazing game. At least that's what everyone thinks. At least uh, back in the early 2000s before the internet spoiled this part for everyone. At the top of the mountain, in the final screen of the whole game, something catches your eye. It's a trainer, one whose sprite is very similar to Gold's. The trainer doesn't say much when you talk to him, only a series of dots. But a battle begins anyway, and then you finally realize just who this trainer is. It's Red, the protagonist of the first game. You see hints of his existence throughout Kanto, like his mother talking about how much she misses him, but it's still completely unexpected for him to be here of all places. The first Pokemon he throws out is a level 81 Pikachu, and the first thought you have immediately after this is, oh crap, 
Red's team was the strongest out of the first two games up to this point, by a huge margin, and to this day it's still one of the hardest to beat. Up to this point, most people's teams will be around the upper 40s, lower 50s, especially since all of Kanto's gyms are so easy, so there's not really much of a need to grind. I'd recommend getting them to at least a bit 50s for this battle. I didn't vote just because I wanted to see if I could do this without any grinding. This Pikachu is the highest leveled, but goes down to fastest. And its thunders sure are more accurate than they should be. Then there's his Espeon. Its psychic attacks are devastating, so bring a dark or ghost type to take it out. Third up is his hardest Pokemon, in most circumstances at least, his Snorlax. Its body slam is pretty much a one at KO. You can use Rest to restore its health and its status conditions too, so don't bother paralyzing it or something or anything. And it can even attack while asleep with Snore. Taking this thing out is a nightmare. It takes so long to chip down its HP, only for it to restore it all rest. But there is a trick. If you have a ghost type that knows Curse, it helps out a lot. Spike comes in handy too, since it reduces its PP. Unfortunately, I did I got rid of that on my Gengar. It varies which Pokemon he sends out next, but most of the time it's something that's super effective, or at least not weak to what you have out on the field. His other free Pokemon are Recanto starters. Red's Venusaur is the easiest to take down since it just spams Solar Beam even against a fire type. His blast choices Surf and Blizzard are annoying, so thank god again for Curse. And lastly, you face up against his Charizard. And this Charizard is the most terrifying thing in the whole game. All it does is spam Flamethrower, which doesn't sound too bad, but the damage it does is insane. It even takes like half of your alligator's health. Granted, it's not even level 50, but still. The only good thing is how it doesn't even have that high a special defense, all things considered. So, Surf and Psychic are able to take it down. At least if your Pokemon can survive its flamethrower. After the fight, Red doesn't say much just like before, only disappearing as mysteriously as he was encountered. Pokemon Gold, Silver, and Crystal definitely deserve the high praise they get. A generation changed more than any other Pokemon game with the fine tuning it did to the gameplay. But music is phenomenal. It pushed the Game Boy Color to its limit, has loads of things to do, some great characters. This is the only game in the series thus far to have two regions to explore. I still have loads of fond memories of the time I first got to play this game. I was 15, it was 2017, just when Pokemon Gold and Silver were going to get released on the 3DS Virtual Console. I was so excited since this was the only way to get to play the game back then, just because of the whole Pokemon is evil thing my parents believed back then. So I remember buying a 3DS eShop card with some money I had lying around, weeks ahead of its drop on the eShop, and then I was just planning on downloading it from a 3DS, keeping it a secret from everyone. The only issue was, I was going on a fishing trip with my dad, grandpa, and uncle the same day I dropped, and the place we'd be staying at didn't have internet. The place we'd be staying at was literally like just a tent. Thankfully though, uh, we didn't have to leave until 9am, and I thought I'd get to download it before leaving. Oh boy, was I mad when I realized it wouldn't be available for download until noon. I basically remember like going into a Walmart bathroom to download it, and then I finally got to play it on a road trip there. I had a lot of fun, it was, a, it was a fond memory, I can't think of this game without thinking of that time. There's even like this one thing that happened during a trip where my uncle like stepped on something, cut his toe open, and then uh, he, he, I was I saw him and he asked me to go get some help from someone. So I went over to my grandpa and I told him what's going on. And basically all I said was my uncle's name uh, cut his toe. And then I like walked off. And uh, I don't know where, remember where I was going, but yeah. And then he ended up having like cut part of his toe. Like not like just some skin and stuff. Not like part of his toe with like the knife. Then he like cut that later in the night to, when we ate summer sausage, so. Yeah, fond memories overall, and the fishing trip only last like a, one day though, because all everyone else was like really um, overheated because yeah, um, them being old and stuff compared to, I, to compared to me. It was a fond memory overall. Overall, I'd say Gen 2 is my second favorite Pokemon game. With Gen 3 being slightly better in my personal opinion. I will say though that I didn't have as much fun playing this game as I usually do, probably because of how many times I've played it, so I wish I would have waited off a little before doing this video, or, or at least played Heart Gold and Soul Silver instead. Oh, and I really regret playing the virtual console version. The color just looks so bad and everything looks terrible, so sorry about that. If you guys want me to make more Pokemon retrospective videos, tell me in the comments below, and also tell me which game you want me to do. 
Although it's gonna be a while, probably till the summer before I make any more of these videos, because I, let me tell you, I need a break from Pokemon for a while. Anyway, I hope you all enjoyed the video, and I wish everyone a great year.